different words that you can find in scripture and last week I think we yeah we dealt with uh, the resurrection mm -hmm. and the week before that we dealt with salvation and today thanks to one Susan Clark um, she's one of our favorites way up there in the northeast section of the US um, we're going to deal with a word that I'm really intrigued with and that word is abide. And I'm telling you right now that I got some insights on that word that was just like incredible. Um, but I'm going to hold off my thoughts until it's my turn to actually speak. But we just wanted to, first of all, encourage you all to make sure that you also keep up with us on YouTube. All you have to do is go to YouTube and uh, type in Adoration Talk Radio. And at this point, I want to say it's over 350 videos. And this is probably going back since 2020. And I couldn't even believe it uh, because I know that I personally had a hand in every one of them. Uh, but it's a lot of content for you guys to check out. And um, we pray that you will be blessed by the things that we've done in the past. And we are really praying mm -hmm. that you will be blessed by what we cover today because I think we got a good one. Hello, Gloria. It's good to see you. We have missed you. So it's, it's good to have you in the house. And, and lastly, before I bring uh, Myra on, um, I made an executive decision to start putting these... Uh, Mac and Myra Sundays out as an event. Um, I think what I was failing to do in the previous two weeks is to also make sure that I was tagging people within our actual group, the ones who are with us all the time. So uh, going forward, including today, uh, I think the communication would be better because we want you guys to find us. We want you to comment, good or bad, and we want you to really be participants. And we're still looking for a few more words. I can tell you right now, I believe that we have another word coming up. Uh, I can't remember whether it's uh, next week, but I think reconciliation is in there. And I think there's another one. Deliverance. Deliverance. I, <laughs> Deliverance. So if y'all find me and Myra some words outside of uh, reconciliation and deliverance, we would be more than glad to cover them. With that said, my darling, we turn it over to you. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for the blessing of your son, Jesus. Thank you for every opportunity to share your word and to be an encouragement to those who hear, Father, and to acknowledge that you are the Lord over everything. We love you, we honor you, we praise you in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Amen. As he was saying um, about this word abide, I got some things too, which kind of surprised me, which really blessed me because I was looking, hi Dan, how are you? And Dayon. 
Great. God bless you both. Um, normally, when we think of the word abide, those who are you know familiar with the Bible, you go to John 15, and I did. I went to John 15, and and it's Jesus talking to his disciples. Well, we know that we're also his disciples. So, you know, his words to them, uh, his words to us also. So I'm going to read a little bit of it. Um, John 15 says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. You know, that's cutting it back. It hurts, but <laughs> he prunes it that it may bear more fruit. So that's, that's that cut cutting thing we go through because we all go through it because we, we're not there yet. There are things that he needs to uh, produce in us that can flourish. So it continues with, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. These are his people. He says, but abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Knowing that, what we ask is going to be according to his heart. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. See, they are disciples, we're disciples. As the father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandments. And abide in his love. You know how great the love of God is that he sent his only begotten son that we would have eternal life. When I was looking up the word abide, the biblical translation really stuck with me more. It says to dwell, to remain, to be present, to be held and kept. Mm. I said, wow, that's beautiful. But it, you know, it made me think. And it's something I had heard years ago and it always stayed with me we we know the story about the um the fall of the the jericho wall but did you know how wide that wall was you know you think of a stone and another stone but people actually lived in that wall rahab lived in that wall so she was abiding in a wall she was dwelling within a wall because it says in Joshua 2.15, Then she let them down, these are the spies, by a rope through the window, for her house was on the city wall. She dwelt on the wall. That's not my words, that's the Bible. She dwelt on the wall. So actually, she was living in a wall. That was her home. Her actual home. And that took me to the word home. And it took me to Psalms 127. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. So how can we not, he's a, we are abiding in him. So we're a house. It's coming to that, I'm getting to that scripture. We are a house. It says in Hebrews 3, 4. Now this is talking to the Jews, but encouraging them in their walk with, with Christ. He says, so they're going to talk about Moses because that's where they're coming from. This is not about Moses. This is about Christ. It says, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, because they've been called out of darkness into the eternal light, out of the darkness of the God that does not have a Redeemer. Because God says he is sending a Redeemer. He's sending a Messiah. And they're stuck with God, not receiving the fullness of God. By not accepting Christ as their Savior. So it says, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, mm. Jesus, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him, to God, 
who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful to all his house. Because Moses was a great leader. And three different religions acknowledged Moses. The, the same man is in three different religions. Because that's how great he was. But he was not the greatest. But this one has been counted worthy. This one is Christ. Of more glory than Moses. Inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. We're at the house. Mm. For every house is built by someone. But he who built all things is God. So what does that make us? And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant. Moses was a leader, but he was a servant. For a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterwards. Because Moses had a great testimony of what God would do in creating a people. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are. You hear that? Whose house we are. If we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. So when he says abide in us, in him, excuse me, abide in him, it's like living in his house. We're resting. We are dwelling. We are kept. But it's our choice. Because you remember when Matthew, in Matthew 28, with the Great Commission, and Jesus came and spoke to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He's keeping us. And he's talking to these disciples before they're going off into a journey that is dangerous. And some of them are going to die in the, in the, in the midst of this, their journey. And what are they doing? They're teaching. They're talking about the Lord. They're going in. To, to all these nations. And you say, well, that's not me. I can't do that. But you know what? You live in a house. And you may live with a parent. You may live with an aunt. You may live with a sister. You may live with a brother. That's part of a nation. And as his disciples, we are to love them. We are to bless them. We are to teach them. We are to be an expression of the love of Christ to them if they don't know the Lord. So we are called to be disciples. He's building us up to be, to answer that heavenly calling. Because that's what we're called for. It's not about, I'm going to become president of the United States. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. You can do those things. But wouldn't it be lovely if, if the president of the United States honored God? And said, as for me and my house, we will serve mm -hmm. the Lord. That's what he's called to do. That's what he's called. Because he built, God built him a house. But is he willing to, to dwell in it? God builds us a house. We belong to him. We are his. We are his house. And we are responsible to show forth that love. You say, I'm not going to this country. I'm not. We've done that. And we're doing that. But that's not all. That's not for everyone to do that. I remember I was so frustrated when I, I got my call. Mm, about 50 years ago now. And it took me 18 years to leave this country and go to another country. The call was to go into the world. That was my call. It took 18 years to do that. And if I had said, you know, I'm not going there. This is, I, I'm, I'm going to go and do what I want to do. I would have missed out on the blessing because you know what? I listened and I went and I have not regretted a day of it. Was it hard at times? Yes, it was hard. But God put a passion within me and it was his passion. Because it was his passion 
to speak to, to whoever I came in contact to use me as his servant to mm. bless others. But if I had stayed here and my call was to be a teacher, which is what I wanted to do, what I thought I wanted to do, you know, I could have been a teacher in the school. I could have been the one that helped my daughter when, when she was a teenager. She had a, a principal in her school that would pull her aside and take her into her office and pray with her. Now, I was a praying woman. I was saved, but she couldn't hear from me. It was just too hard. I was a mom. <laughs> because it was that, that resistance. The enemy wanted to keep us separated. But God had a plan that she would be in a school where there was a God-fearing woman who knew her, her, her calling. She was a principal in the world, but she was a God-given disciple in her, in her house. And she carried that house with her because God built her. She was a house full of the Spirit of God. And she used to pull her in the, in the office and pray with my daughter. And I was like, so what? we have no excuse. We are his house. Wherever we are, we are to put away our frustrations, our dislikes, our uh, oddities at times. Whatever it is that is keeping us from being the servant God has called us to be. Because we're not abiding in him. Because he, if we abide in him, we'll change. We'll reflect him and be the disciples we are called to be. Because Isaiah 32, this is Old Testament. It says, but the work of righteousness, to be rightly in right standing with God. It says, the work of righteousness will be peace. And the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. My people will dwell in mm. peaceful habitation, in secure dwellings. And in quiet resting places. And that's the result of it. So we are going to be blessed. When we bless God. By being with him. By dwelling with him. By resting in him. By listening to him. And waiting on him. And waiting is like Mary. The mother of God. The mother of Christ. <laughs> she said. You know in Luke she said. I am your handmaid. I'm the servant. And if you could look at a, 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 be at a restaurant and you could just lift your finger or, or wave your hand a little bit and those waiters will come to you. That, basically, that's what she was saying. I'm waiting for him to raise his hand. Whatever he wants me to do, I'm gone. I'm attended to him because he's attended to us. But he's waiting for us to speak to wait on him, to listen to him, to abide in him. And we wind up being blessed because we live in peace. We don't have confusion. We live in the righteousness of God. We have a quiet spirit. We have assurance in him. And it's not that I'm doing this to get this. This is the result of being dwelling in him. Abiding with him. Putting him first. And saying, Lord, whatever it is you want, I'm willing. And that includes standing down. Because I know my time is, is coming to an end. It may, may, may not be tomorrow. It may not be next week. It may be 10 years. It may be 20 years. But I know because of my age and how life goes on, I'm not going to continue. And one day he's going to say to me, Mara, you got to stop. Oh, he will stop me <laughs> in his own way. And I have to be open to that, to be, be understand that I can rest in him. And hopefully he'll say, you know, you've been a faithful servant. Because that's what I want. Because I want him to be pleased with me. I don't want him to think that I can just wander off and do what I want. No. The ministry is about him and ministry is life. That's something my husband has always talked to me about. You know, you can't separate it. Ministry is life. So if you're living with someone, that should be ministry in that household. 
I minister to him when he needs it. He ministers to me when I need it. It's not about priorities. Like, no, it's whatever's needed. Because that's how God is to us. He ministers to us when we need it. But he also builds us up so we can go out and do the work. But he knows when we need to rest. He knows when we need to go. But it's all according to his design. So abiding with him, we can hear from him. Because I, I couldn't get over that scripture in, in, in Hebrews. We, we are his house. Whose house we are. If we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. I love that. The confidence is not in us, it's in him. And the rejoicing comes from him too. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And the hope, all of that comes from him. Mm. And we re need to remember that. That everything we are, was, will be, is caught up with him. If we hold fast to it. If we dwell with him. And he will keep us. He will hold us. He will dwell with us as we dwell with him. Amen. Amen. Bread of heaven, sit down from glory. Many things you were on earth, a holy king, a carpenter. started off with that song with this word that we call abide unlike how I normally start these things off just right into the scripture I want to tell a story and uh, this is actually I have two stories to tell so the first story is about some very good news that uh, we got on yesterday Many of you know that um, we have a lot going on when we're not doing this Sunday program. Uh, but since December, we have been ministering to hundreds of people in Pakistan. And what started out as just a need for some Bibles became a whole mission to restore a building, actually, first of all, purchase a building and then restore a building. And on yesterday, we saw the completion of all the fundraising, all the labor that was done right by our Pakistani neighbors. And what we saw yesterday, and we're looking at it from WhatsApp. But what we saw <laughs> was a beautiful presentation. And guess what, y'all? They even created a room for when uh, we're ready to come and visit. But here's the thing that I wanted to encourage them. And I promise you, this has everything to do with Abide. We celebrated because the construction was completed. But that was a building that was made by cement and bricks 
and concrete and tile and wood with the fixings. And honestly, not to bring any kind of negativity to it, but anything could happen to a naturally made building. Someone could be jealous enough to destroy the building. A natural disaster could take the building. And what I tried to encourage my beloved Pakistani neighbors on yesterday was that we have a different kind of building that we celebrate. That's a building that's not made by bricks or mortar or cement or tile or wood or concrete but it's a building that was made by the master builder God, God, Yahweh, Jehovah. And we have to understand that even as we're connecting now on Facebook, we are joined together by a commonality that is outside of this whole universe. So powerful that he has the power to bring people that are of different races, different cultures, different, different ethnic groups. He can bring us all together with the one common denominator that we can all rejoice in, and that is Jesus Christ. So when we're talking about abiding, we're talking about not taking all the things that happen in our natural life so seriously that we put our confidence in those things. Yes, I was joyous to see people that were worshiping outside in the cold, and I'm telling you the truth, but to see them be able to have their own building, a safety place for them, and not only that, but they adorned it beautifully, well-painted, furnished, everything, and there's still more that we are going to do for that situation. But nevertheless, I needed them to understand that when God made us, he made us in his image after his likeness. And we, through Christ, had the capability of being able to still operate in this world with but the same power, the same anointing, that Jesus himself used to raise himself from the dead. So when we talk about abiding, we're talking about so many words that we can synonymously put in its place, whether we're talking about connecting, binding, uniting, remaining, and so many other words. We need to recognize that it's not a one-way relationship. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about that because it is so critical to understand it. Now, second story. Again, everything was popping yesterday. So I'll just say we had an acquaintance who had some very discouraging news. News that would make that person have to wait a whole nother year still with no guarantee that that person was going to get what they wanted. And we had to have a chat because it brought up something that I tell you, it related so much to the text that I'm going to share with you in a moment that I had to talk about it here. And it's that Everything that I heard from this individual talked about, I'm so disappointed. I'm discouraged. I don't know why I'm doing the things that I'm doing and I'm not getting the results that I want. I, I, I. Everything was about I, I, I. I didn't get what I want. I didn't receive what I think I deserve. I don't know why. God is not listening to me. I don't know why I keep going through these things and not getting what I want. And I'm telling you guys, that is not abiding. 
What I'm trying to say is this. God has a plan. And I'm just going to give you this for free. If it's not happening for you, and you say that it's a desire, check yourself. Is your personal desire more important than God's? That's a serious question that I'm putting out on the table right now because we all want things. <laughs> I, I desire things that I have not received. For my wife can tell you, I have been waiting for some news to hit. I've been waiting for over a year and it has not happened yet. The question is, do I then turn it to God and say, God, why have you forsaken me? God, how come I'm not getting what I want? Well, maybe, a uh, light bulb moment, maybe the things that we want sometimes does not line up with God's plan or they do line up with God's plan, but not in the time that we want it. So I had to tell this individual, grow up. Stop whining. Stop complaining. And why am I saying all of this? Because we find in the scripture that I'm getting ready to read to you that there was murmuring. Another way of saying griping. Another way of saying complaining that was going on. And I'm going to take you guys from the New King James Version. I'm going to take you over to John chapter 6. And we're going to focus, we got a lot of stuff to cover, but we're going to focus on verses 43 through 58. And I'm going to kind of interject stuff as I read this because I'm telling you, everything that I've just shared is happening right here. And you'll understand why I sang the song that I sang. So if you have your Bibles, here we go. John 6 starting at verse 43. Jesus therefore answered and said to them, do not murmur among yourselves. Okay, now let me set you up. We are at the uh, tail end of chapter six of John. It's a big chapter, a lot of stuff to read there, but it all starts off with one of the miracles that is accounted for in all four of the Gospels, and that's the feeding of the 5,000. And just to give you some insight, Jesus provided the nourishment needed for those people for a divine purpose. But like we do to this day, we take divinity and we turn it into just our own personal gift, our own selfish receipt of something that God has given us. And now we're looking for the next thing. All right. And let me explain what happened because the reaction of the people truly it negated the purpose of why Jesus did it in the first place. Jesus had a holy purpose in feeding the 5,000, but the 5,000 just took it as an opportunity to get a meal and not understand the deeper lesson of there's another kind of food that you can be fed that isn't something that I would cook up in my kitchen or is not what you would buy at the grocery store or go to a restaurant for. There's another kind of food and this is food that God has given us by way of Jesus in which we will never hunger again. But the people were fat and happy with that portion. And, and I'm, I'm gonna tell you something because 
this hits deep with me because I even lead efforts where uh, food is provided to areas of Nepal and right in Baltimore City. And I think it's beautiful that we have the opportunity to give out food. But you know what? In a few hours, that food is gone. And now you're back to square one and you're hungry again. And for some people, that might give them an attitude of doing anything in order to satisfy the fleshly need. Those things could end up going against the very nature of God. I see you, Susan. Amen. Look, let me explain this to you. What I'm trying to say here is that when we read the rest of John 6, I want you to read it with the understanding that we have to get out of the natural way of thinking. If you're talking about abiding, okay, then the first thing that needs to happen is that your agenda gets put to the side. You die to those things for the greater purpose that God has for you. I'm telling you, you can actually live a life where you might have disappointed disappointments, but you'll never really live with disappointment. And what I'm saying is that things are always going to happen that might turn out to be something that you didn't want. But if you are abiding, remaining, clinging, blending, binding with the source of all of creation, how can you ever truly be disappointed? I told my individual yesterday, just yesterday, there's a difference between just loving God when he has done something for you and just loving God no matter what. We all choose what side we're on with this. Now, Jesus has made his decision. He came to love, heal, and forgive. Y'all like how I took that out the, the <laughs> hymn? Okay, but that's what he came to do. It is his desire that all come to him. But we have to be open enough to, first of all, realize that we need him, that we are malnourished in our bodies, and more importantly, in our soul and spirit. Let me continue reading. In John 6, 44, Jesus is talking. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets and, and they shall all be taught by God. So if you see something like that, it is written in the prophets. Let's take a, a journey real quick and go to what the prophets have said. Isaiah 54, 13. All your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. Jeremiah 31, verse 34. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. These are the things that were written by the prophets. The last one I'll share with you in Micah chapter four, verse two. 
Many nations shall come and say, come and let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion, the law shall go forth and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now, the prophets were speaking to the Israelites. So let's keep this in context. This is the Old Testament uh, being the launching point of the New Testament uh, gospel as now said by Jesus because it is Jesus that says it is written in the prophets. And the thing about it is the people of that time were well versed in the writings of the prophets. So Jesus took his audience right back to all of their synagogue teaching and learning in the day. And all of them grew up going to the synagogue, hearing these passages, knowing what the prophets of old had prophesied, but not understanding that Jesus himself would be the fulfillment of those prophecies. Why am I saying this? We must, must, must know that it is God, our Father, who draws us through Christ. We're not making a decision about anything in this life. You might think you are because in your mind it popped up one day, I need Jesus. But honestly, everything that has gone on in your life has been moving you forward to the day that Finally, finally, you recognize you need a savior, but your savior was always there. So let me continue. I'm back in John 6. Now I'm at, uh, I'm still in uh, verse 45. It says, therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the father comes to me. And that's Jesus. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. So remember, Jesus had not yet gone to the cross. He had not yet gone to the grave. He had not yet rose. He had not yet ascended. But yet, he is telling you right here, He's the one that was sent by God. And if you read the scriptures in your Bibles, you will see that when he's referencing he and me, they are capitalized to let you know that he is the divine one. There's no doubt. There's no shame in his game. He was revealing it then and he's revealing it now through his word. In John 1 verse 18 it says, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten son who is the bosom of the father, he has declared him. Only the begotten, Jesus, the bosom. Where's your bosom? It's right here around the heart. Your bosom, the bosom of the father. The very heart of God came through 40 and two generations just for you. If you accept him as Lord and Savior of your lives. In verse 47 of John 6, it says, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I want to say that again. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. Now comes the part, and you'll understand why I sang the song. Verse 48, I am the bread of life. Remember guys, old covenant, I am. What shall we call God? I am that I am. Just in case you didn't think the first I am was enough, we're going to say I am that I am. There's none other but I am. I am sent me. We serve I am because I am is the one who has created 
all things. And Jesus is making this statement and realize the Jewish ear understood he was saying he was God. God is the breath of life. I am the bread of life. Sorry, I said bread, but bread of life and breath. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread. Not the bread that my wife had to go and defrost last night. This bread is alive. It's not going to decay. It's not going to age and wither away. It is the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. And we saw this fulfilled at the cross, at the cross where we first saw the light and the burdens of our heart rolled away. That's where we experienced it. That's where there was a shift in the atmosphere. That's when the veil was rent and no longer do we have to go through any man. And I'm telling you this to this day, you don't have to wait and go to your pastor to reach God. You go through Jesus. Jesus is the uh, the mediator between God our Father and us. And Jesus assures that the communications that we have with our Father are the ones that we need to have with him. He becomes the filter to make sure that our petitions are true mm -hmm. and are worthy of the Father's attention. Now, Jesus is saying this, and look, in verse 52, ha, we had murmuring to start us off, but now the Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? And I want to stop right there, because that question and that mentality is what has many of us that think that we're saved and uh, fire baptized and saved and filled with the Holy Ghost, that's what actually has us hemmed up. We keep trying to understand God through a human lens. We keep wanting to just take things based upon our intelligence and we come up with our concepts and our opinions about things that have a holy meaning. We know those of us who have been around the block a few times understand that this is symbolic and that we're not going to lay Jesus out on the table and carve him up. Although it is because of our sin nature that had him stretched out on our behalf. This eating, this meat that Jesus is talking about, his flesh is the word of God. And maybe, just maybe, if we spent more time in his word, we wouldn't come up with all of these opinions and all of these feelings. I'm not speaking to you out of my feelings. I'm speaking to you out of the word of God. And if we're talking about abiding, how can you abide? How can you connect? How can you cross pollinate or whatever I'm trying to say when you don't know the entity on the other end. How are you going to connect if you don't know the word? How are you going to have relationship and understand his voice when your ears can only hear naturally and not spiritually? He says, 
Most assuredly, I say to you, you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood. You have no life in you. So the word, okay, and we know that the blood, the blood, if we're even looking at it naturally, without blood inside of us, we are not going to live. Blood is the liquid that allows us to be able to have life. And when you combine that blood with the water of the Holy Spirit, okay, then you have the power that Christ used to raise from the dead. And that's all we've been talking about. Last week, we were dealing with resurrection. Well, how can you be resurrected and then not abide? <laughs> if you're operating in God's power, don't you think it's about time to cling to him and stop relying on the things that you think, the way you feel, the way the world is trying to condition you? Don't you know that they have a mind, uh, a manipulation thing going on and they pit Everybody against each other. They pit men against women, children against uh, other children. They pit nations against nations, colors against colors, cultures against cultures. And at the end of the day, we come out of this thing as losers when we don't abide. Now, use John 15 in the vine. He says, for my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. These are what are called the, the hard sayings. This is one of them that the Lord uh, said throughout the Bible. These are the hard things. I don't think they're hard at all when you really understand what he's trying to say from a spiritual perspective. It says, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in uh, uh, I in him. As the living father sent me and I live because of the father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. And as I get ready to close out, remember what I said in verse 56. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides, abides in me and I in him. This is where I had the, the, the epiphany. We always look at this thing from abiding in him. But almost in the undercurrent, he promises to abide in us. And that is the blessed assurance that we have. So let me let me set this up as I get ready to truly close this out. God had given the Israelites this manna from heaven. Nobody knows what this manna was made of. It was a particular concoction that was created by God to sustain life. Unlike the, the menus that I prepare Myra on a daily basis, uh, where I'm doing all the prep and, and doing all the cutting and dicing and slicing and, and grilling or, uh, you know, air frying or, or baking or broiling, God just simply formulated this substance mm -hmm. and it dropped down from heaven. And this was still... Uh, interesting substance because you had to eat it within a particular period of time or it just went away. All right. So that was God's way symbolically of prophesying the day 
when a different kind of manna would come. Now, the first manna are the people that I might talk about that keep receiving the gifts of God and waiting for God to do more. Okay, God, you show me your 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 recent miracle. Give me something else. I, I'm only going to have confidence in you, God, when you do something for me. Because it's all about me. You know, because I am in fact my own temple. I'm my own God. And and if I'm not being served by you, God, then I don't see why I need to even understand it. And I will say this. Did you did John not know? And this is I don't normally name job, but I'm gonna name job this time. Kanye West, now, isn't it incredible that Kanye, you know, because he felt like his prayers weren't answered, he basically said, hey, let's kick Jesus to the curb, because Jesus ain't answering my prayers, so instead of me still following Jesus, now I'm just going to say I am a God. That's literally what just happened. And I'm, I can say this because he's a public figure. He said it. Because I'm God. And anyone who disagree, I'm the God of me. And you can't tell me who I am. It's another thing I don't like in Christianity, the fear of God. I'm only regurgitating what he said. He said that Jesus wasn't responding to him. It is, but I, you know, I, I have my issues with Jesus. There's a lot of stuff I went through that I prayed and I didn't see Jesus show up. So I had to put my... Uh, my experience in this world, my experience with my children, my experience with other people, my experience with my account, my experience with my brand, and my experience with the level of music that I was dealing with in my own hands. Like, that's the only agenda that Jesus has is to make us happy. And this is the fallacy. And this is what happened to those that were in the wilderness. Remember, they wanted to just go right on back to Pharaoh and create uh, more bricks with no straw. That's what they wanted. They could not be patient enough to wait for God to do his thing because somehow we feel like we are privileged enough that we can dictate God's timing. And God says, huh, you can think that if you want, but hey, this is my way. This is my direction. This is my purpose. Nothing that we do here is of our own volition. Everything that we do here is because God has purposed us to do it in his time and in his place. And I'm going to tell you guys that keep on thinking that you are not blessed and that God has somehow forsaken you. You're not abiding in him because you don't love him. Because if all you want from anybody, even in a natural relationship, is what they can do for you, you don't love them. You love what they can do for you. If the money runs out and all of a sudden you you kick the curb, oh, well, you know, Myron and Mac, they ain't hooking me up anymore, so we're gone. Well, that says more about you than us, okay? And I'm saying to you, imagine this a million times, a gazillion times greater when it comes to the things of God. God blesses us each and every morning with life. He gives us the opportunity to get it right by Him. And what we do is say, I'm so upset because I didn't get my way. Are you serious? <laughs> Are you serious? And forgive me if I'm a little agitated, but I'm tired of it. Susan, this is your subject. I'm tired of it because we are literally spitting on the very blessing that God has given us, the greatest gift that he has given us, and we use it like it's just a slot machine in Atlantic City or in Vegas. I'm just going to end with this. Abiding means that we are joined. We are connected. We are united. And when we draw nigh to him, he tells us he will draw nigh mm -hmm. to us. So maybe today 
in our prayers. Why don't we do this? Instead of petitioning God for all the things that we want and petitioning him for what we think other people want, why don't we just abide with him? Tell him how awesome he is. Tell him that there are not enough words in the English or in the Spanish or in the Japanese or any other uh, country that I can't think of off the top of my head right now, any other language. There's no words that can express the awesomeness and the, the, the total dominion that God has over the universes. Mm -hmm. But that because God, you still incline your ear to hear me. For once, I'm not going to bring my bitterness. I'm not going to bring my uh, suitcase full of troubles and problems. I'm not going to bring all my ailments. I just want to rejoice in you. I want to worship. I just want to, I want you to be Happy, oh God, I want you to be joyful that your servant understands that I can literally praise and worship my way into a whole different way of thinking mm -hmm. where I can actually stop having my personal pity parties and I can truly have compassion for you, God, who gave everything that little old me mm -hmm. might live. Why don't you do that? Change your prayer language. Acknowledge him, his awesomeness, his dominion. Tell him how you can look out in the sky and you can see his handiwork. Tell him how you make the seasons just do what they do. Nobody can do that but you, God. And watch how life gets better for you. Does it mean that things go away? Not at all. That it might add on <laughs> to your trouble. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. I feel like saying it. I got to say it. Trouble don't last all way. Okay. But in seriousness, you will be so empowered and filled with the Holy Spirit that those things that you look at as problems, they don't have any dominion over you. This is really my heart speaking to you guys, and I know I get um, really <laughs> animated. And I live for this. <laughs> and everybody in my condo has heard it's, what I'm saying. It's exciting. They know it. But but it's because I care that much that I, I just want people to I just want people to love God right. and know that God loves them back. That's it. You you, you guys want to say? Yeah, when you were talking, I just had this picture. <laughs> And there's a picture of you see Jesus standing at the door knocking, which is based on Revelation in, in the Bible. But it made me think, like, that, doesn't that just show the, the mercy and the, the humility of God through Christ that he's going to knock on the door of a home that belongs to him? It's like knocking on your heart. You belong to me, but I'm not going to come in unless you invite me. And what does he want to do? Sit down and, and suck with you. That's what it says. Mm -hmm. But that's relationship. To come in and sit down and share a meal with me, with you, with him. He, he wants that. I mean, that's if you, if you put that in your, in your spirit, it's like, with me? <laughs> Why would he want to come? Because that's how personal he is. And that's how important we are to him. That he would humble himself, as it says in Philippians, mm -hmm. and die for us. Leave the place of glory to come here. I mean, this no one is like him. No, no one is like him. Nobody greater. <laughs> Nobody greater. Nobody greater. Nobody greater than you. Would you say? I searched all over, couldn't find nobody. I looked high and low, still couldn't find nobody. 
Nobody greater. Nobody greater. Nobody greater than you. That's abiding, y'all. Mm -hmm. Let's do it one more time. I searched all over. Couldn't find nobody. I looked high and low. Still couldn't find nobody. Nobody greater. Nobody greater. Nobody greater than you. Nobody greater. Nobody greater. Nobody greater than you. Nobody greater. Nobody greater. Nobody greater than you. God bless you and keep you in his perfect peace with our minds stayed on Jesus. God bless you. God bless. Everyone.